Hello everyone and welcome back to another PCB uh, overview. So we had the non ti the last time, so let's take a look at a 10 ti uh, This, just like the last card, is also uh, one of the cards that were sent in by a subscriber of the channel. Uh, this is the card that I was not able to repair, otherwise I would have uh, sent the card back. Um, but like, if you watch the diagnosis video, basically the uh, there's a strong likelihood that the memory controller on this card is dead because every single memory bank has errors. So either the memory controller is dead or every single memory chip died at the same time, which is fairly unlikely. Um, so yeah, um, but in this video we're going to look at the PCB itself, not my specific card, um, more the VRM of, uh, of the card. So yeah, this is a one of the cheaper but still custom GTX 1080 Ti's. This is the Gigabyte Gaming OC uh, GTX 1080 Ti. There's also a um, a 1080 Ti Aorus Extreme. That one has a different different PCB and a very wacky VRM setup. Uh, this one's less wacky, um, but also slightly less um, high end. Even though this like. Because a 1080 Ti doesn't pull a lot of power, uh, this VRM is more than adequate if you ask me. So yeah, let's get into the VRM, starting with the vCore VRM, which sits over here. So that's our vCore. And this is an 8 phase, so 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. And the controller for vCore is right over here on the back, and that is a UP9511. So the UP9511 is basically the most common controller on GTX 10 series cards. It's still being used even in the 30 series sometimes. Also on the 20 series. Um, however, on the 20, like on the 2080 Ti, on, on a lot of 2080 Ti's, you actually have the 9512 which is a slightly upgraded, more modern version of the 9511, um, but still most of the uh, design remains the same. So the UB9511 is a very analog uh, controller. There's not a, like the 9512 has some digital functionality. The 9511, as far as I'm aware, is completely analog. So everything's done with resistors and uh, voltages and uh, you, basically, you can't use an EVC, an Elma EVC with the with the controller. Um, but as far as the controller goes, it's an eight-phase controller. Since we're having eight eight phases in our VRM, that's fairly easy. We just have the PWM signals going directly into the VRM without any doublers. And the switching frequency, uh, which I should have read before recording the video. Does it not say it in the data sheet? It might actually not say the switching frequency in the data sheet. I really should have checked that. Uh, oh, okay. So here's a table of all the switch, uh, all the different switching frequencies that the controller can be set to by setting a resistor. Which, since this one is analog. Yep, you can just change the switching frequency by swapping out a resistor. And the table shows that this controller can... Um, so let's just say 8 phase. So that people don't have to listen to the audio all the time and can just look at the picture and get the information as well. And the table says this goes from 200 to 600 kilohertz. And this is most likely running at probably 300 to 500. 600 is a bit high, 200 is a bit low. Um, like a lot of cards I see run between 300 and 450 stock for the switching frequency. Um, so yeah, so that's a controller uh, for the VCOR VRM. And let's get back into it. So since we have eight phases, we have eight uh, power stages or DR MOSs in this case. and these are FDMF 6823Cs. Uh, we've seen these before on the um, on a lot of GTX 700 and 800 series cards. 
and Gigabyte is continuing to use these on the uh, 10 series, which is completely fine. These are fine DRMOSs because these um, handle 50 amps each times 8, that's 400 amps. So it's not like ridiculously high, um, like the 980 Ti Strix, which was over 700 amps. But then again, a 980 Ti is much more power hungry than a 1080 Ti, and so and 400 amps is still plenty. Um, however, you really wouldn't be running every power stage at the max, so you would likely run less current through them. And yeah, I mean this, you might you might get um, a bit close to the limit uh, when you do liquid nitrogen overclocking on the 1080 Ti. But as far as I know, the power consumption uh, on liquid nitrogen for this card is actually not that high. At least compared to uh, 700, 900 and uh, 20 series graphics cards. And probably also 30 series. Um, Pascal has been a very tame architecture and also just the 1080 Ti core is also fairly small compared to like the GK110 uh, and the GM200. So. Yeah, I've like for a cheaper but still custom 1080 Ti. I've, I think this is a pretty good VRM. And to put this into perspective, we have the basically like there's a different controller, but we have for the rest of the components basically the exact same VRM on the Windforce 980 Ti uh, from Gigabyte on the Palette Jetstream GTX 780, 780 Ti, and 770. Uh, as well as corresponding models from GameWard, because Palette and GameWard uh, share their PCB designs. Um, and let's say it like that, if this VRM can handle a GK110, this can handle a GP102, because the GP102 is much more tame than a GK110. And yeah, I, I, I can vow for that, because I have this VRM on my GTX 780 Jetstream, and I have run this card at up to I actually think over 1.4 volts, and it, yeah, the, the VRM was fine. <laughs> uh, so it this will be fine as well. Um, so yeah. And let's also take a look at the capacitor choice. So Gigabyte went completely SMD polymer for both input and output capacitors. So you can see the input capacitors over here, all of them 47 microfarads. Um, yeah, 847 microfarads input capacitors right next to the VRM, and then we have more uh, input caps over here in an SMD but still can type um, package. Um, so I, I think as far as input filtering goes, this is actually pretty good. Like directly at the VRM, a, a, a good capacitor package choice. The capacity itself might be a bit low, but like that's the thing. Um, if you have a better capacitor package, you you need less uh, capacitance to get the same effect as you have with a worse capacitor package and more capacitance. Uh, then for the output filter, Gigabyte also has chosen, again, to go full SMD polymer. And here they have used a bunch of 330 microfarad uh, SMD aluminum polymers. And as you can see, they've left some pads empty um, for modders to still fill in, and then there's also a bunch of uh, multi-layer ceramic pads all over the card that can also still be populated. Same for the back. Uh, this is probably all V-Core. I'm not entirely sure about this one. This might be V-Core, it might be memory. Uh, actually, I think that's memory, yeah. Um, but yeah, the, the other capacitors should all be V-Core, so there is plenty of modding potential here, and also in typical Gigabyte fashion, we are getting 560 microfarad capacitors directly behind the core, which is a very nice thing that they tend to do, um, because Nvidia doesn't really, like Nvidia and AMD don't don't really allow to modify anything in basically this general vicinity of the core, like basically anywhere there like you, you can once you're past the memory chips you can change whatever you want but in this general area the closer you get to the core the less uh, manufacturers are allowed to modify things 
Um, but what they are allowed to do is to um, swap out worse components for better ones. And while most manufacturers just copy NVIDIA's design, Gigabyte usually actually gives you higher capacitance capacitors, uh, which can help because now directly behind the core you have a bigger uh, reservoir for energy. So when a transient occurs, uh, you might not even need all the output filtering you've stacked at the VRM if you just have better output filtering uh, directly behind the core. So I really, really like that Gigabyte always gives you these nice big 560 microfarad uh, capacitors directly behind the core. Um, so, yeah, I've, yeah. Um, and then there's that. So the memory VRM on, on this is a bit hard because my card actually had uh, a problem with the memory VRM. As you can see, it's missing. Um, but this is a two-phase uh, VRM using four dual NFETs uh, being controlled by this controller over here, which is an unidentified UPI semiconductor controller. Uh, basically, any any time I see a UPI controller, that's not a 9511 or 9512. I just go, oh, I'm never gonna find a datasheet for this. So yeah, uh, I have no datasheet for this. <laughs> um, but yeah, so modding memory on the uh, modding memory with these kind of controllers is always a bit hard. Um, but usually uh, the, the pins of these controllers actually match, like this is a fairly standard, I think, 24 pin package. Usually um, controllers with this package are pin compatible, so you just need one that has a datasheet and then hope that the pins are actually the same um, and then just mod it that way. Um, so yeah, but we have a two-phase memory um, there were, like, there's more input filtering, also SMD for the memory, and then there's more output filtering, also SMD for the memory here. Um, and yeah, like, it's a fairly standard two-phase memory VRM. It is fairly far away from the memory modules themselves. Um, but, like, as you can see, Gigabyte apparently really wanted to stay within the uh, reference dimensions for the PCB, so they couldn't really extend it upwards to put the memory VRM closer. Uh, well, actually, they could have shifted vCore down and then just, like, crammed it up in there, but they chose not to. So, yeah, uh, this memory VRM probably just runs at a higher voltage because they compensate for the voltage drop they're gonna have. Uh, going from the VRM to the memory chips because it like has to go through the entire vCore section inside a PCB layer and You're gonna be dropping a bunch of voltage doing that um, So yeah, they probably compensate by just having it run at higher voltage um, Then another thing that's kind of interesting is here we have our INA3221 uh, uh, Which is measuring the uh, power consumption so you can see there's a uh, there's a shunt here, there's a shunt here, and then I think... Actually, where's the third one? Is it on the back? Yeah, it's on the back. There's a shunt here, and uh, the NF321 measures the uh, power through these shunts. Um, sadly, you can't just remove the INA3221, uh, which is what you, you can do that on... Uh, uh, you can do that on 700 and I think also 900 series cards. You can just remove the INA3221 and then your power limit is just gone. On the 10 series, I've been told the card will refuse to work properly if you do that. So you can't just completely remove the power limit. You can still obviously just flash an XOC BIOS or just shunt mod the card or um, do a slightly fancier version of the. Uh, shunt mod where you just feed a false voltage level into the INA3221 making it think you always consume something like 10 watts or something then you also effectively don't have a power limit anymore um, so yeah be because this uh, on the 10 series it's kind of harder to deal with than others I thought I wanted to mention that um, but apart from that oh there's a there's another shunt here what uh, wait, what? Yeah, the INA3221 is a three channel monitoring chip. It only can monitor three shunts. How are there four on the board? 
or do they have like a single channel INA 319, uh, 319 somewhere? Um, I'm a bit confused by the presence of this shunt down here because I know that this one here is on the PC Express lot because that one was shorted when I got the card. And then the other ones are like very close to the power inputs, so those probably belong there, but I am very uncertain about this one actually. Um Yeah, that is actually uh I I, I actually do not know <laughs> why there's a shunt there. Um So yeah, so are there a few more finishing things to say? Uh, there's also minor raids on the card, which I haven't gone into. We have a minor raid over here, that should be PEX. We have two minor raids over here, which I have forgotten what they are, but one of them is 1.8 volts and the other one is 5 volts. Um, I, I do not know if it's this way, like, maybe it's this way, maybe it's this way, I... I don't know. <laughs> um, but one of them is 5 volts, the other is 1.8 volts. Um, uh, this might be the map, the BIOS chip, and then this one, I don't know, could belong to the output. This only has a single BIOS, I think. Um, it's always a bit hard to tell on Gigabyte PCBs, because they just always are this crowded, like... Yeah, like, when you see a bunch of white stuff on a PCB, it's just... Yeah, that's Gigabyte. <laughs> um... But, yeah, uh... Yeah, that's pretty much all the minor raids done. Um, so yeah, that that should be it for for the PCB overview of the GTX 1080 Ti Gaming OC. Um, yeah, it, it, it's a it's a less expensive custom 1080 Ti. Um, I like it. Like the VRM is it's not super ridiculously overpowered, but it's gonna do its job considering that basically. Pretty much the exact same VRM has been used on far, far more power-hungry cards, and it's been fine. So it will be fine on this one as well. Um, so yeah, like if if you want to get a 1080 Ti and not completely break the bank, I think this one's actually quite a good option, especially because it has so many uh, empty pads for more capacitor. Like there's also capacitor pads up here, which is probably on the memory. Um, like, yeah, this this card is probably very very nice for modding. This I I like if <laughs> if I had a working one of these, it would probably be very fun to mod this card. Um. So yeah. Uh. So that would be it for the end of the video. Um. So time for YouTube begging. So um. Subscribe. Like share if you want and thank you all for watching the video and until next time goodbye